Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to everybody who has joined us today for our talk on the Rahma Foundation's halakha. We normally have a halakha tonight um, on Friday nights. And given everything that's happening, we have moved it to an online halakha. So welcome to all of our sisters who have joined us, those who normally join us um, at the MCC in Pleasanton and those who normally join us from abroad and from other parts of the country and of California. Welcome all of you, inshallah. We look forward to um, having you this evening. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. As is our norm for the Friday night halakas, we typically start with um, some Qur'an and dhikr because today we started after the Maghrib prayer. Normally, if we were in the masjid, we would have prayed together in jama'ah. But because we are um, online, we are starting actually, um, we'll jump into the dhikr portion of our talk tonight and before we start our talk tonight. Insha'Allah. For those of you who um, have been part of the Holocaust for some time, you know how this goes. I think given everything that's happening around us, it's probably a really good idea to um, do some dhikr. And the reason we do dhikr or remembrance of Allah at the beginning of our halakha, um, normally we do this in order to teach the, the different forms of athqar or remembrance of Allah. But today, especially more so, we want to make sure we do some dhikr because it's really a time to center ourselves. There is a lot of anxiety and, and um, you know, fear and a lot of trouble that people are feeling, and rightfully so. And I think this would be a great time to really do um, our dhikr together. So for those of you who know the adhkar, go ahead and, and start with me. And for those who have not heard them before, please go ahead and listen closely. Normally what we do is we start with um, the Arabic, and we usually have the translation and the transliteration. So for today's sake, since we don't have everybody together, I'll start with the Arabic. I'll do three of each. And then I'll also explain what they are in English. All right, everybody, let's start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The first is, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. And this translates into there is no power or strength except through God. And that is definitely something we're going to come back today in the topic of that there is no power or strength in all that's happening except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير the translation is Allah suffices me and he is the best to depend on and the best Lord and the best helper. And certainly something that we need to really hold on to today in these days because we do need his help and assistance in this time and always. The third, repeat with me inshallah. Ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghithu aghithna. Ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghithu aghithna. Ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghithu aghithna O living O caregiving your mercy we plead for help us And number 4 la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimin la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimin la ilaha illa anta subhanaka there is no God but you, praise be to you. Verily, I was amongst the unjust. Number five, Salamu qawla min rabbin rahim. Salamu qawla min rabbin rahim. Salamu qawla min rabbin rahim. Peace, the words of a merciful Lord. Number six, laysa laha min dunillahi kashifa. لَيْسَ لَهَا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ كَاشِفَةً لَيْسَ لَهَا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ كَاشِفَةً No one less than Allah can lift this. And the seventh is salawat on the Prophet 
اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد we send praise and blessings upon the pro- and prayers upon the prophet muhammad peace be upon him so for those sisters who have been part of our halakas before this is typically how we start our halakas um, over the course of time we build from saying the athkar three times to five times to seven times and so on and really it is meant to be as a teaching lesson to um, learn how to say these beautiful different forms of athkar or remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, also we say them together as a form of teaching um, so that we learn uh, the, and also as a form of centering ourselves because by the time you get to friday night of a busy week you have been here and there and so much has happened and especially in a week like this week there has been so much difficult news and confusion and things are changing so rapidly so quickly um, not even daily really it's hour by hour minute by minute nowadays and um the idea of really centering yourself is really really important and so alhamdulillah i hope inshallah the starting of the dhikr is kind of our um tradition and i was glad to be able to do it with all of you even though it's virtually or remotely before i begin the talk inshallah i'd like to um, just briefly introduce the rahma foundation for those of you who've been with us for some time you are well aware alhamdulillah of our organization but for those of you who may not um, know us i wanted to share inshallah on the next slide you'll see a little bit about who we are um, the rahma foundation is a non-profit organization educational non-profit organization dedicated to educating muslim women and girls and we are very much committed to um, programs that we do like this virtually online and others similar to this we have monthly programs that we like to roll out through the online system um, for everybody to take hold of but here we are located in northern california and we have a multitude of events that happen under the rahma foundation um, organization through the year like these friday night uh, halakas for women that we have uh, located at the MCC in Pleasanton, California, along with all of our girls programming, which happens on Friday night from toddlers all the way to high school aged girls, youth groups that we run, and a mentorship system for the teachers who teach those halakas for the kids, for the girls. Um, they are then mentored into a teacher's halakha, so it's a murabbiya program that we host. We also have a Foundations of Hifth program for the learning of tajweed for girls as an after-school program, and a variety of um, short intensives that we do through the year for women and for girls, as well as summer camps that we host for our elementary, middle school, and high school age girls as well. So alhamdulillah, this has been our mission and dedication for about 15 years or so now, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless us and accept from us. And what you're attending tonight is what would have otherwise been our Friday night halakha for um, for the woman that we do. And alhamdulillah, it's been a really beautiful um, a, a gathering that, you know, week in, week out through the academic year on Friday nights. And there's also a live stream for those who are not able to attend or come to Pleasanton in person. So if you're new to us, I'm glad you joined us tonight and I hope inshallah you'll be able to join us uh, more regularly on Friday nights. Now, I wanted to tell you that we have been for the last um, academic year since September when we started this year's halakas, we have been covering the seerah or the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the book that we've been covering is, is called The Prophetic Narrative. It's a two volume translation of the Sira done actually by a woman author, uh, mashallah, um, Ansa Samira, and translated by a team of women scholars, mashallah, into the English language. And it's a beautiful Sira book. And inshallah, hopefully in the future, you'll be able to join us for the continuation of that Sira Halakha. Tonight, though, we have a different topic, though related, and we are going to touch on some aspects of the Sira tonight as well. But we titled tonight's talk, Spiritual Fortification in Times of Difficulty. And really, the reason for this, as you can imagine, is everything related to what's happening with COVID-19 or the coronavirus, um, and all of the fears and anxieties and really difficulties that people are facing and dealing with, which are very real. And I want to touch on this both from um, as a mental health 
you know, um, as a clinician, as a psychiatrist. But I also want to touch on this from a spiritual dimension as well, and really bring the two worlds together. But because I think that's, inshallah, hopefully going to give us some ease, I hope and pray, inshallah ta'ala. Before I begin, I was really reminded how today we sit here today um, and, and kind of grappling with this news. It's March 13th of 2020. And on March 15th of 2019, almost just about one full year ago, you might remember that we were all grappling, the Muslim community and the worldwide community was grappling with other really devastating and difficult news. I hope inshallah you probably all remember this and don't need a reminder, but if you probably think back, you'll remember Christ Church shootings in New Zealand happened exactly a year ago today. It was a Friday. It was also a Jumara. And, you know, when we reflect on the lives that were lost in New Zealand and what happened to the Muslim community throughout the world, but particularly those of us who live in the West, and the sense of safety that was taken away from us with the shootings. And we had this reaction and very strong and necessary reaction that happened because we felt that we were transgressed upon because people were in their place of worship in the masjid in Jumu'ah on Friday doing their obligatory Jumu'ah prayer when they were gunned down, you know, gone down, machine guns, may Allah protect us and may Allah forgive um, th those who passed away and grant them the highest levels of Jannah and accept their martyrdom. And subhanAllah, when we think about the difficulty of that, I can't help but connect the two things because today is also Jum'ah and a lot of the discussion that's been happening all around us is how do we, how do we, uh, we're, Jum'ahs are canceled. Right? How do we get to the Jummah prayers? Um, and, and what does it mean for Jummah to be canceled? Is this the first time in history has th this happened? The answer is no, it's not the first time in history. But maybe it's the first time in modern history or in the history of, of your memory um, in a place of safety, in a place that is otherwise safe and not in war. Because if we were to pick ourselves up and drop us into Syria, for example, then in modern history, yes, Jumas have been canceled for lack of safety reasons, right? So for those of us who are in non-war-torn countries and in a place of otherwise safety, you have a parallel between, subhanAllah, you know, something like the terrorism that happened in Christchurch shootings taking away Jumu'ah from us. And today, exactly a year later, a virus that we cannot even see with the naked eye, it is so tiny, right, microscopic, that has also taken away our Jumu'ah today. And when we think about the feelings that that evokes, right, the anxieties that that brings about, it's a very real thing. And sometimes, subhanAllah, you don't appreciate a thing until it's gone. And maybe at that point in time, we didn't really even think a year later, we too would be prevented from the Jumu'ah, but for a completely different reason than our sisters and brothers that were in Christ Church, New Zealand. And it reminds us that we don't depend, our Islam and our deen is not dependent on a masjid, and is not dependent on a space and location. It is something that is a connection between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our hearts. And even though we may be sad that we can't go to Jum'ah and uh, people are very much concerned and thinking about Taraweeh, Ramadan is just around the corner next month, inshallah. We'll, and later in the talk, inshallah, I hope we can get to back to the topic of Jum'ah and Taraweeh in more practical manners. But people are also concerned about all the Umrahs that were canceled. We have dear friends of ours who were meant to be actually leaving for Umrah right now and have been prevented from that and others who are planning for Hajj and are really questioning whether or not they're going to be able to make Hajj this year. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to balighna, well first we're in Rajab, so to balighna Sha'ban and to balighna Ramadan and to allow us to get to our 
Jumu'ahs and allow us to get to our Tarawih's and allow us to get to our Umrah's and allow us to get to our Hajj. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate all of these things because just like he was able to bring in this small, tiny, itty bitty virus that prevented us from all these things, in a blink of an eye, he also can take it all away. Right, and this is kind of the state of a believer, of a mu'min, of a mu'mina. That even though you, this is what we're feeling is kind of a ban. Speaking of, you know, bans and travel bans and such, um, that we are not banned from the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, even if we were quote unquote banned from our masajid, our haram sharif, right? And um, it also is a reminder to me, you know, this morning I want to share with you the story because it's hitting very close to home. And I think for many of you in different ways, the, the, the coronavirus and co, you know, COVID-19 is hitting personal, um, hitting you personally in different ways. For me personally, my parents, both of my parents are um, elderly and they're both overseas at the moment and have been there for a few months and were meant to travel back to the States um, tomorrow. And there is all this uh, anxiety because not only were we worried about the new European ban because their travel from overseas, they're going to pass through Europe. And there was all this discussion on, will they be quarantined? Will they let them in? If they are quarantined, you know, for how long and where? Is it better for them just not to travel altogether? But then is it safer there or safer here? There's all these questions our family has been grappling with all morning. SubhanAllah. But um, in addition to that, where they're located, there have been these really, I mean, we're so busy with the COVID-19, maybe we haven't even paid attention to some of the very difficult weather circumstances that have hit other parts of the world. And where they are currently, apparently there had been such heavy, 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 heavy rains and storms and floods that had all of the, um, that everything stopped because of the, the floods. Um, Juma'a was stopped not just because the virus, but because of the sheer flooding and, and rains that were happening that made it impossible for people to leave their homes. Water was see seeping in even into you know closed doors and windows and um and electricity was lost so when we got, finally got a hold of them they said we don't have electricity we don't have you know heat we don't have light we don't have um water running water uh other than the rains in the streets of course everything is kind of really um uh, you know the pharmacies are closed the, 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 we can't get to our medicine they had run out of medicine too and then on top of that all, we're trying to figure out, do they get on a plane or do they not? And if they do, are they going to be quarantined in some foreign country and we don't know how to get hold of them? So this is our personal family struggles we've been going through today. And I'm sure everybody has a story of some sort that they have been personally struggling with as well. And when I reflect on these things, I think deeply about the state of um, our safety and how the blessing of things that we don't even appreciate until they're gone, right? We don't appreciate necessarily our health until we feel sick, and we don't appreciate our masajid until our, they're taken away, and we don't appreciate and we complain about them, right? We don't appreciate the electricity until it's cut off, the water, running water until it's cut off, the toilet paper until it's gone from the stores. <laughs> SubhanAllah, you know, and not to make light of any of these matters, but it's a really deep thing to think about. And then we're reminded, see these, these now it's not even an epidemic, it's the WHO, the World Health Organization, has called it a pandemic, right? And these pandemics, what they do is they really help us in the silver lining of it is the empathy. And in our in the field of you know psychology and psychiatry, we talk about the difference between sympathy and empathy. And sympathy is sitting back and going, oh, poor them. They had their electricity cut and the water cut and their quarantine, right? But empathy is putting yourself in those shoes. And for so many people, that doesn't happen until you physically, physically put yourself into those shoes. And I'll give you an example. You see this whole thing that's happening with the coronavirus, as difficult as it is, you know, the coronavirus at the end of the day is not actually as um, heavy of an illness as, for example, a different illness like the Ebola virus that happened in uh, that had the outbreak, you know, in Africa, and because Ebola happened on the other side of the world, right? It was over. They talk about the other virus, 
I teach a class at Stanford called the Psychology of Xenophobia, and in the last um, and in the last uh, final, some of the some of the the students presented on the psychology of or sorry the uh, the xenophobia of the coronavirus, which I thought was a really interesting um, concept of thinking about all of the, the the fear of the unknown and the fear of the other. And in this case, it wasn't necessarily a certain group of ethnicity or people or religion like Islamophobia, but rather it was the virus itself and anybody who was coughing and sneezing or anybody perhaps who looked Asian because that was the epicenter of the virus happened in China first. So when you think about what that means and think about you know empathy, putting yourself in those shoes. So again, Ebola was over there and we sympathized. But now that Corona was, COVID-19 has made its way over here and we are literally stock, stocking up on necessities, dealing with school closures and masjid closures and to help being told to isolate and social distancing and being told to stay home from work and having to figure out how to work from home, have kids at home, you know, make sure that there's enough essentials in the household in case we're quarantined, voluntary or involuntary, and all the fear that comes with it and all the confusion and difficulty that comes with it. This is the definition of empathy, right? Literally putting yourself in those shoes. But Muslims, we do this every year, yearly, by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan. Right, where all year long we say, Subhanallah, the people who are poor, Subhanallah, the people who don't have enough to eat, Subhanallah, the food that they do have isn't nutritious, and we try to give sadaqah and we try to give zakat and we try to help and make dua for those folks until we get to Ramadan and then we put ourselves in those shoes and we start to empathize with how it feels to not eat and drink consistently, right. And so subhanAllah, the difficulty that we're feeling today, um, we don't really know all of the all of the divine wisdom as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent COVID-19 to us. And people try to hypothesize why that is. And honestly, the best we could say is, yes, this is a tribulation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we are very careful to say that we don't know Allahu alam whether it is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't want to be very careful not to get caught up in that kind of mentality because, because we don't actually know. One of my teachers would often say to us, you know, when something would happen, bad would happen, and you think back and say, what did I do that possibly caused that? She would say to us, you know, it is actually healthy to try to connect the dots. However, you can't say with certainty that it is because of X that Y and Z happened, okay? Very, very careful because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether or not this is actually a punishment and it may be or it may not be. There may be some other divine reason why in his divine wisdom why it is that this is happening, but it is a tribulation. And when tribulations come to us, we're told that we must tie our camel like the story that all of you know, where the Prophet Sallallahu saw a Bedouin who came to pray at the masjid and entered into the masjid and left his camel and entered in without tying it in any way. And the Prophet <laughs> called him back and said, come here, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to go pray. And he said, what about your camel? Ma ma'na, yani the meaning of which, what about your camel? And he said, isn't Allah going to take care of my camel for me? And the Prophet sent him back and said, go tie your camel, then tawakkal ala Allah. Tie your camel and then depend on Allah, right? And so the depending, the, the, the tying our camel in this case is, is basically saying, you know, because people are saying things like, you know, if the virus was meant to come to you, it's going to come to you. And it's, there's a boom projected here, certainly in California, but certainly all throughout the country at this point in the world, perhaps. And people are saying, well, if it's coming, it's coming. What are we going to do? Well, yes, in some respects, that is a partial truth. If it's coming, it's coming. If it's written for you, it is written for you. This is true. However, tie your camel, then depend on Allah, right? So we don't just say, well, if it's coming, it's coming and you know, so on. We actually do the very um, guidelines that are being sent. And I know they're being sent all around and I don't necessarily have to go through them, nor am I an infectious disease specialist in any way. 
But I want to, you know, remind you the things that, and, and all of you have been reading on this, of like, you know, washing your hands frequently and not touching your face because the spread through the nose and mouth and being careful with social distancing, keeping distances and not being in large crowds of people. And, you know, take these things seriously, right? Here in California, at least in our school district, schools have closed. And the uh, for, for, for at least the remainder of the month and into the month of April, and you know where I teach at Stanford, they have shut all of the, the classes, put everything online. So all of us are scrambling to learn how to teach online. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah this is great practice for that. But the, um, but the reality is, you know, and even into the next spring quarter, we don't even know if they're going to allow students back onto campus, right? So there's all of this chaos, really, is what's happening all around us, and probably for good reason. But when this happens, we do have to take the precautions seriously, because Allah Ta'ala alam what exactly is coming with all of this. But what we definitely know is that when Allah sends an illness or a sickness or a tribulation in this way, he's also told us that he sent the cure and he'll set, he will send the cure and the cure may come instantaneously. There's already a news report today that maybe they've isolated COVID-19 and can figure out what to do with it. And maybe there's still some, maybe this is months in the process or maybe it's very soon. Allahu alam. But we know this for sure as believers because that is something Allah has promised. The hadith says, and with every illness Allah has sent down, he has also sent a cure. It doesn't say when, and it doesn't say how. It says that the cure is coming. So we must believe that as mu'mineen or believers. Also, we have a, the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that says that sickness is a sign of purification in our religion, right, in Islam. And um, basically the Prophet Sallam said, the example of the believer when he is afflicted by illness or fever is that of a piece of iron in fire. Its defects vanish and its good remains. That we believe as Mu'mineen, as Muslims, that when we have illness or sickness, it is a tathir, it is actually a purification for us. And as much as this is difficult for people to, to sometimes think about and people are dying, what do you mean? Some are, yes, of course, dying and may Allah have mercy on all of those who are afflicted and ill. And those who have passed away, may Allah grant them the highest levels of Jannah and forgive their sins and help us as well, inshallah ta'ala. But there are many who are getting the virus, but also surviving, alhamdulillah, that's the majority. But I think what's important here is to remember this concept of sickness or illness is something that actually does what is purifying to us, right? Also, the, the Prophet ﷺ said that no calamity befalls a Muslim except that Allah removes sins from them because of it, even if they were pricked by a thorn, right? So every, every um, discomfort that we feel, it's actually a expiation of sins. So the sense of anxiety that we feel is, is, is a well-known and steady thing, and it should not be something you're embarrassed of or something that people say to each other, no, you shouldn't feel that way. I actually don't think that's useful whatsoever. It's actually something the Prophet وسلم, acknowledged, and he saw um, amongst his, his companions and actually told them how to deal with their emotions. So who are we to say to everyone else, Ah, oh, don't get all worked up. That's not proper. And nor is it from the sunnah. Nor is it from the adab of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rather, rather, what we're supposed to actually say and remind each other is that the sense of anxiety is a normal feeling. And it is something that Allah gave us. He actually put into us the sense of fight or flight kind of um, um, system that happens in our bodies for a good reason. And part of our core beliefs is to really understand the, and reflect on the wisdoms as to why it came and to know that we're going to be, we'll see the light at the end of the tunnel because of it. So no calamity befalls anyone except, but this is from the Quran directly, and no calamity befalls anyone except by Allah's permission. And whoever has faith in Allah, he will rightly guide their hearts through adversity. And Allah has perfect knowledge of all things. Right? So we have to put this trust in him that he has a purpose and a wisdom and that, you know, even when we don't understand it, that he knows what he's doing, that he is boss, capital B, right? That he knows why all of this is happening. 
you know, I'm going to take a moment here and just pause because whenever I say that, I rem- I'm reminded of, you know, when the when the the war in Syria broke out, and many of you may know that I studied in Syria in my in its beautiful, glorious days when it was still intact. I mean, I love bring it back to better than it was before, and bring all of its people and all of our teachers to safety. Amin ya rabbil alamin. But I early on in the conflicts, early on. Um, my last trip to Damascus was in 2010. And the conflicts, as you know, the war started in 2011. And very soon after, maybe in 2011 or 12, I was very sad and grief stricken, like so many others, of course. And I complained to my teacher and I said to her, <clears throat> Um, this is so terrible. I can't believe this is happening. Um, uh, you know, just, I was devastated and, and I'm not Syrian, of course, and she is, and, and her family is Syrian and all of them. And this is where she lives. And, and she was, ha- had to leave. And, and her response to me was so amazing. She said, Anya, do you know how all of us, um, those of us who are Syrian love Syria so much. I said, yes, you guys are very, very proud of people and love your country so much. And she said, especially those who are Ahl al-Din, the people of knowledge and ilm, we uh, we're, are so attached to Syria. You know, it takes, you know, moving mountains to be able to, to tell us to move from Syria and to go somewhere else. And I'd say, yeah, that is that is a true reflection. I mean, there was never a possibility of them going to somewhere else and us as students visiting. It was us always coming to them. Always, you know, the Sham Sharif, right? MashaAllah. And um, and she said, you know, now that all of us are kind of this this war has happened, whether we liked it or not, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picked up all the people of knowledge, and there were so many people of deen of knowledge, not just of the men and the scholars, but of the women scholars too, men and women alike scholars. And she said it's like Allah picked us up and and and, and threw us across the world everyone in every which country and she started naming off countries in which fellow teachers had had moved to i mean it places as far as like you know greenland and people as far as you know uh, you know very far of places and i thought subhanallah and she said this could be a reason why the knowledge that we all had so so coveted and kept only in damascus is now going to be spread across the world Right, because each person that moves somewhere will start teaching there, and will start, you know, bringing knowledge there and khair there, and that will grow and that will grow and that will grow. And she said, and soon you'll see the, the result of that. And I just sat back and listened to this and was like in disbelief. Like, how could somebody who was so directly affected by this the war, you know, have such a response? But that is the depth of the iman. That is faith, right? And. Sometimes, like I said, we don't know the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these things. And this was her kind of interpretation of making the sil- seeing the silver lining in something so terrible and bleak, right? And so like this too, we may not fully understand all the wisdoms behind the adversity and the hardships and the universal change <laughs> that is happening um, and, and the moments by, of struggle. Every day, every day, we keep hearing little bits of knowledge and news. Um, and and uh, we're going to talk about disattaching ourselves from following the news so closely, honestly, and it has a negative effect on the soul. It really does. It really does. But in these moments, we also start to understand how Allah is in charge and he is boss and he knows what he's doing, even if we don't comprehend it and know why such things are happening. Right. And so we learn, right, that that our um, really our selfishness, Right, so much, so much of COVID nineteen has to go back to human selfishness. Honestly, I mean, as you're looking at the illness spread, you know, it being a um, you know a zoonotic um, spread, as in to say, it goes from animal to human, and you think about the cruelty we have dealt to the animal kingdom, right? And you think about the laws of Islam and the laws of Allah in what is considered to be halal and permissible meat and what is not. What is considered to be animals that are meant to be safe and kept away, right? Versus messing with them and getting that into our systems, right? With human beings. You think about so much of COVID-19, you think about um, how much we in the Tahara, the rules of Islam, how much we wash. I was telling the Stanford students yesterday in their halakha, think about how much we wash as Muslimin. You know, you have wudu, 
You have five daily prayers in which you make wudu. So you are washing your hands and washing your face and washing your limbs at least five times a day, just about, right? We have washing in istinja. We wash after we use the toilet, forgive me. But this is very important considering the toilet paper chaos and craziness that's happening out there someone said they haven't seen more um advertisements for the bidet you know like the the the, the water hoses the the lotas if you will as they have since this outbreak has happened with with toilet paper it's like the first thing people think of oh i need you know toilet paper and for us as believers we're like uh no actually what you need is is water you know and you could dry off with a towel if you're out of toilet paper, but you need water, right? We wash in istinja, we wash in wudu, we wash in ghusud, we wash the sunnah of washing before we eat our food, and the sunnah of washing after we eat our food. We are constantly washing, right? Right? Uh, 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 right? The tahara is shitrul iman, right? The, the cleanliness is half of our faith, right? It is constantly happening. And when you think about the recommendations that are happening, it's like, wash your hands. Don't touch your face and nose and, and mouth. Um, uh, what's it called? Don't shake hands. I'm like, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Considering the, right? We as believers, we, what? Mashallah, with the opposite gender issue of shaking hands. I mean, all these things, and you're like, alhamdulillah, right? And then all the rules that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in place, whether they are the rules of halal and haram or the rules of etiquette and social etiquette and interaction. I mean, we really should just not, not only for ourselves, but we should be role models really for all of humanity. SubhanAllah. Really thinking about these things. Um, but Despite all of that, everything I just said, I still want to affirm to everybody that definitely there is still a sense of anxiety and difficulty in all of this that we're feeling. And I want to tell you why. Some people are asking, why is this hitting us so hard? Why is this hitting us so hard? And um, of course, there is a piece of, we don't know what's coming. Like, we don't know what this is. And, and we think about this tiny, little, bitty, microscopic virus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there's different uh, ayat in the Quran where he's drawing parables and comparisons. You know, there is the ayah, for example, where he draws a comparison to, you know, um, to the, the wing of a moth, right? And a tiny, tiny little thing. And another verse, he draws the comparison of this one, the ba'uda, right? And here he draws a comparison of the mustard seed, a tiny, tiny, little, tiny, little seed, the smallest of all. And he draws comparison to these little things and how they can have such a big effect. And you think directly of COVID-19, tiny little thing and having a massive effect on people, bringing us down to our knees, literally, you know, in prayer. Um, but the anxieties around it, are not just because of the fear of the unknown and the fear of what's coming and the changes of circumstances around us, staying at home to work and keeping kids at home and being quarantined. But also you have to think about really a couple more things. I started off the talk talking about Christchurch. Really the reality for the modern Muslim, you know, the effects of the, of the, of the trauma and the anxieties that we're feeling are cumulative. Like, it's, it's not a month or a week goes by that there isn't some terrible news, right? I mean, just the other day, I, I saw this and I was so appalled. I mean, speaking of teaching a course on xenophobia and the coronavirus and everything else, the, 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 the front page of the New York Times article on Trump banning, uh, doing the European travel ban of basically people not coming from Europe unless they're American citizens banning them, the picture that they had was a picture of a masjid in Turkey on the Asian side, not even on the European side. Like, I mean, talk about the mix of xenophobia and Islamophobia and coronavirus all mixed in together, subhanAllah. Like, you know, it's like you can't help but see Islamophobic attacks one after another after another, right? Difficult, uh, you know, difficult uh, traumas, maybe personal things, but also communal things, also global crises that we see ourselves in. You know, you think about the Uyghur Muslims, you think about Yemen and all the difficulties and people in Idlib. There's humanitarian crisis, crises everywhere around us, right? And then there's at home kind of Islamophobic attacks and, and, and you know, personal difficulties. So this is a cumulative effect. So when you're feeling really, really anxious and really, really, your, your stress levels seem really, really high, this is part of the reason why, right? There's also a fear 
um, for many of for many here, I mean, this is a typically a Friday night holocaust for women, and for many of the women, they're also moms. And for the moms and dads too, of course, there's also the fear for the kids, right? There is people hearing about how this virus really affects the immunocompromise. And many of you are caretakers of the young and of the old. Many of you are in between generation where you have your parents or in-laws and you have your children and you're in between taking care of, you know, two different generations. And those extreme ages are the ones that tend to be affected the most. Some of you are carrying children, Michelle, are pregnant and, and um, immunocompromised in that way as well. So there's all these different um, aspects. So there is the fear for our safety right? The cumulative effect of trauma. There is the fear of the unknown. There is a fear of how to help the elderly and the children. There is the fear of that our safe places, like our masajid and our gathering places, like our halakas are taken away from us. So when, when these things happen, don't, um, don't say to yourself, oh, this shouldn't be the case. I shouldn't feel this way. No, rather we say to ourselves that this is a common reaction. And there are ways to cope in a healthy manner with these reactions. So let me tell you a little bit about this. You know, first and foremost, I really want to, what we're doing tonight, for example, is healing <laughs> in the fact that we are what? Talking about this. Bottling all up, it all up doesn't ever help. It's really important that you actually talk about your thoughts and your feelings, particularly with loved ones and people who you trust, right? Share with each other, be vulnerable with each other and actually share. Because once you say to a friend, hey, I'm having a really rough time with this, the other person might say, me too. And then you have a common ground and you're not feeling like you're the only one and ashamed of the feelings that you have right? You find that actually everybody else or many, many other people are also feeling this way too. And therefore it's safe. It feels safe to actually be able to talk and it takes the load off. So I really actually encourage this. I also encourage um, you to remember those who are having difficult times. This helps a lot of people, you know, thinking about those who are um, in, in more difficult straits. For example, I have been thinking, and, and later when I talk about um, practical tips, I really want to talk about those, you know, many people, so many people are, um, I don't want to use the word hoarding, <laughs> but it feels like that. Um, but they are stockpiling, right? They're really building up their essentials because we don't know what's happening next in terms of quarantine and voluntary. Are we going to have what happened to Italy happen to us, a voluntary quarantine and so on. So they're kind of like building up and stockpiling on the rice and the beans and this pasta and the essentials and, and so on. But then I think about those who don't have the ability to do that. I think about in California here, we have a lot of homeless people, a lot of people who live in the street because it's normally throughout the year, for the most part, it is warm. And there's not that fear of freezing to death on the street, although, of course, it still happens. And I think about people who um, work hourly jobs or people who are dependent on tips because they work in like a restaurant business and so many people are not going out to eat. And so many people that have hourly uh, jobs are not being, you know, the jobs are not happening uh, because people are not going out and they're being severely impacted. And although they had a roof over their heads, now they might be homeless too. And I think about all those people that are in a lesser situ or a more difficult situation than what I am in. I think about my folks, for example, today and think about the lack of electricity and water and running and so on. And yet still saying, Alhamdulillah, despite the very confusing situation they're in, it helps to remember what other people are going through too but never to minimize your reality because your reality is your personal reality. And I see this in therapy. People do this a lot. They say, well, at least they have this very difficult thing happening in their life. And then they'll say, well, at least I'm not like a refugee that's in such and such country. And I say, well, was being a refugee ever your reality? And for most of them, they've never been a refugee. And so I say, then why, why are you comparing that right this moment? You have your reality and it's a big difficulty happening. So don't minimize that. Right? But it does help to also remember the reality of other people as well. And for some people, this is very helpful. For other people, they are very action-oriented. And so I said I would talk about action-oriented practical things, especially now that we have the kids kind of with us. For the most part, many of you have your kids. They're going to be home for the next foreseeable future. And so, you know, taking um, actionable things, like all the extra things we bought, maybe we have a little too much toothpaste or a little too much 
rice or a little too much whatever and making little bags honestly like little ziploc bags you know that you could actually hand out and they should see you too also hand out to the guy or the lady on the street who's asking for money or who's begging or who's homeless even if they're not asking for anything right taking action and that helps calm some people too right um taking action could also be making sure that you check in on those who are the most vulnerable in the community like the elderly who no one is checking in on or maybe they're your own elder family members they live in their own place and you don't want to keep because of social distancing you don't want to keep visiting grandparents for example and so you're doing a lot of facetiming but you're constantly checking in and maybe they're not your own biological parents or grandparents but they're like the auntie or uncle in the community who don't have children you know or maybe their children live far away or maybe they're alone and so you FaceTime them as well and that helps right that all helps also I want to say you know t seeking support is really important like all these things that we're talking about could help to an extent but for some people the anxiety is even deeper and even more palpable and of course as a mental health professional I'm going to have to say this which is definitely seek help how from professionals if all the resources we mentioned aren't quite cutting the anxiety enough, right? And now a lot of the mental health professionals are doing therapy online. You know, at the Khalil Center, for example, which is where I'm sitting today, we're actually doing therapy now through the online system. And it's much more easily accessible without having to even leave your home. So seek out the help from people, um, from the professionals who are able to help you even further, right, on your own than being on your own. And lastly, with the part about coping with the reactions, I really want to say, you know, taking time and taking time and subhanAllah, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us nothing but more time <laughs> in this these next few weeks. I mean, think about it. So many people are working from home. Yes, you may be working, but you're home, which means you've cut out the commute. You've cut out the socializing with the peers. You've cut out the talk around the water, uh, you know, um, dispenser <laughs> you've um you've cut out the extra meetings right so so you know or the social gatherings you know you've cut out all not even work related just 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 social gatherings right you are home a whole lot more subhanallah right or in very very small groups and not in large gatherings anymore even like this the cutting out of what would have otherwise have been our friday night halakha and the, the kids halakhas and so on at the friday night at the masjid all of that is cut out which means there's actually more time and time is actually a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something we need to, again, we don't appreciate something until it's taken away from us. And we don't want time to be taken away. Rather, we want to appreciate the time we're given. So how do you actually make use of that time? Well, for example, I asked some homeschooled kids who are close to me. And I said, you know, you guys are homeschooled, so you're home a lot. So for all the kids who are staying at home these days and are going to be staying at home soon and are kind of... Uh, uh, really uh, unhappy about this, what advice would you give them? And they said, this is a time to consider it like an extended spring break, because for many people, spring break is about to come. They said, it's like a long spring break, and you get to do all the things you didn't get to do before. And I said, like what? They said, well, going into pulling out all toys you, you haven't played with in a long time, or maybe something new that you craft that you wanted to do, but you couldn't get to because you're always busy. And maybe you wanted to do something with family members, you know, you, you, your folks, but they were always so busy too. And now it's like family time, right? And I thought, what an interesting um, uh, answer, right? Because it could have been like, we're so bored, you know, <laughs> as the answer. And maybe they will get there. And that's probably part of the reality of all of this, that Allah has given us more time. So really reflecting on what can you do with that time, particularly since it's Rajab. And Shaban is around the corner. And Ramadan is also right around the corner. And this is that time of the year where we would definitely be talking about, come on, everybody, don't, um, don't wait until Ramadan to jump headfirst into it because then you'll just crash, right? We always talk about Rajab, Shaban, Ramadan being the marathon right? Kind of don't try to sprint into Ramadan, but take it slowly as a marathon. And part of that is start upping your fasting. And again, as women, mostly in the class right now, right? We probably have, many of us still have fasts to make up. Perfect time to start fasting, right? For uh, reading of Quran, if we've neglected it and the Mus'haf has collected dust over the year, this is the time and Allah has given us more time to it dust off that mushaf and start reading and to get ready for if you really want to try to do a khatim of ramadan get through 
get, try to get kind of practice and get going before we enter into Ramadan. This is a time of dhikr and remembering this a lot of this, this again, this little bitty bitty thing that's bringing us down to our knees, right? And the, the whole world is getting shut down because of it. This is the time to turn to the one who brought the Ill disease, this virus, to remember that the virus in and of itself can't help anyone and can't harm anyone unless Allah wills it. Truly, you may have been already exposed to it. I mean, there's all the scary news about, which is reality, but scary news nevertheless about, you know, you may be infected but not even know it because you may not show symptoms for so many days. And, and you think about, wow, subhanAllah, like here we are, this tiny little thing that we can't even see and that some of us could actually be carrying it but not got sick. And that's the will of Allah. And the next per this person right next to us, our family right next to us, can be carrying it and get sick. And that is the will of Allah. So this is the time we really turn to Allah, right? The one who gave the virus and gave it its ability to either hurt or harm us. Only he had that ability, subhanAllah. Those of you who have been in the Sita class with me, you have been through the year, you remember now, uh, this is where I'm going to quiz you a little bit. But you remember, for example, the life of the Prophet وسلم, and how he was very, very um, uh, much uh, affected by the idea of um, illness and disease from his earliest days before he was even born. Do you remember, since I can't hear you guys, I'm going to have to... Um, I'm going to have to uh, just tell you, inshallah, but I hope you, by quizzing you, you remember this, that the, the, what is the cause or reason for the Prophet's father's death? Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we learn in the Sira that the Prophet's father, before he was born, his mother Amina was still pregnant with him, when his father traveled to go visit his family members in the city of Yathrib, which is now modern day Medina. And um, there was the fever of Medina that affected, right? It was a contagious fever, possibly a virus, Allahu Adam. But it was those who were not from that area, when they went into Medina, they would often get ill be fallen by the illness or sickness of the fever of Medina. And unfortunately, his father caught that illness and because of it succumbed to his death and died before the Prophet ﷺ was born. Now fast forward just a few more years in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ that we learned about together. And what is the cause of the Prophet's mother's death? Do you guys remember? The Prophet was about roughly six years of age. His mother took him to go and travel to visit his father's uncles in the city of Yathrib, Medina. And she too caught the fever, an illness of Yathrib, and also succumbed to her death and was buried on her way back to Mecca. And the Prophet was then twice orphaned because of this illness. So you think about how directly that impacted the life of the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the Prophet's lifetime, of course there were Sahaba who passed away from different illnesses, but then in the he, he foretold, he prophesied that there would be a major plague that would take the life of many of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. And this, he prophesied this in the ninth year of Hijrah, and truly this happened, that in the, the, the caliphate of Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu anhu, in fact, um, the, the, a plague came in Bilad al-Sham, Ta'un, that actually claimed the life of many of the Sahaba at that time. So when people say, hey, is this the first time these kind of epidemics or even pandemics happen in um, history? In that case, it was epidemic. Um, the answer is no. And therefore, Islam has rules that govern all of these different things, right? It actually governs. Therefore, when people are asking questions like, is this the first time in history there hasn't been a Jum'ah? And the answer is no. In fact, the books of fiqh and the chapter of prayer discuss this. Today there was a, a viral uh, a tweet and message going around about the Mu'adhin in different countries across the world who were calling the call to prayer and in the call say, 
and pray in your homes. And that is exactly verbatim what it says in the books of fiqh that we study in the chapter of prayer. It says under the, the section of inclement weather, things like heavy, 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 heavy rains and mud, for example, um, or storms or heavy, heavy, heavy winds, right? And different madhahab or different schools of law have different opinions on what qualifies. But it'll actually, the mu'adhan will say the adhan and then will say, and pray in your homes. Stay in your homes, right? This is something that is, Islam is a religion for all times and all places, and all people and all weather and all circumstances. So it's built into it laws and rules that encompass all of this, mashallah, right? So we have to also remember this kind of thing. And so the whole thing with Jum'ah, you know, granted the masajid all around were closing because of the recommend, uh, canceling rather Jum'ah because of the recommendation to not have large gatherings or even 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 smallish gatherings however um the concept of not praying Jummah altogether is something again we said what did Allah give us he gave us a lot of time what did he give us a lot of time with our families and so when next Friday comes around probably the masajid will still be closed however if you have the minimum requirement for a Jummah pray a home-based Jummah right it has to be you have to have the minimum of like the imam and the, uh, you know, and anybody, by the way, can be an imam. Anyone can give a khutbah and, and do the jum'ah that knows how to. But if you have three um, men who have reached, or even boys who have reached the age of puberty, right, and onward, right, and you have the imam, right, the quorum of three plus one, you can play, pray this. So, I, you know, if you think about it like you have your, you know, husband who's working from home and you have your brother-in-laws and you have a maybe your brothers or your father or your grandfather or whoever right and there's a you know basically enough to pray and maybe the the muslim neighbor next door right and so on and you can have kind of like a home-based prayer and even if you can't even if you don't have the quorum and can't do the full-on juma and by the way the basic requirements are super super simple but even if you can't quite do this and you just have maybe your kids with you, right? You can still do a prayer together. Like take that time of Jummah that otherwise would have been in the masjid listening to a khutbah to turn on a lecture and listen to it, right? And then pray your four rakahs of Dhuhr together, right? As women, we are fairly comfortable with the idea of either praying Jummah or in a place that's praying Jummah in a space of Jummah or praying Dhuhr, right? It's it's the men who are kind of like, whoa, this is new for us, right? <laughs> and, and it is, of course, new for them because of the obligation of the Friday prayer for them. But a lot of people are having similar worries about Ramadan and uh, specifically related to, you know, Taraweeh and gatherings. For, for many people in their mind, Ramadan is communal breaking of fast and communal prayers, and you're right, that is kind of some of the biggest highlights of Ramadan. And now as we think about even iftars, even inviting family members over and friends over and social gatherings and these big iftars, I am so thankful. <laughs> Those of you who've heard my lectures before related to Ramadan, Ramadan prep and getting the spirituality for a woman out of Ramadan, you know how much I detest large iftars. <laughs> Um, because I feel like the burden always falls on the shoulders of the woman, right? I always, I, I, I'm, I'm baffled by how many women do not get to experience the spiritual aspects of Ramadan because they do these large iftars and they feel pressured or their families expect them to. And I always talk about how, you know, it takes several days to prep. And in those several days, you're not doing your Quran, you're not doing your, you're barely getting to prayers, you're certainly not doing Tarawih, you're not, you know, prepping, prepping, prepping. And then the day of the iftar, you're, and I have talked to women who swear to me that in Ramadan and in fasting, that they are so busy with the prep, they have literally forgotten to pray. Haji, you know, it's it's mind and they're home. It's not like they're out, right? And so all because they're getting ready for this big massive iftar they're about to put on. And then the iftar comes and people eat in exactly like 15 minutes they're done eating. And then what do the men do? Rush off to tarawih. And where are the women? Cleaning up the mess, right? And for the next, right, two days, you're kind of cleaning up the mess. So there goes effectively your entire five days, right? And every time you do one of these, that's another four to five days worth of Ramadan lost. And by the time you count four or five of these, that's your entire month of Ramadan. And for so many women, that is all that Ramadan is. They're like, well, at least I fed people. Yeah, Habibti, the, the idea of feeding people, the, the hadith that talks about the, the reward of breaking someone else's fat literally says, and even with a half of a date, 
you get the reward of the other person who broke their fast, not a feast, <laughs> inshallah. So you know how I feel about this. So I'm already saying, alhamdulillah, we're going to have less of these large iftars, right? Because honestly, for women, they really do not get the most out of their Ramadan because of this, right? And then there's other lectures on the Rahma Foundation. You can access them, inshallah. I won't spend more time on this topic, but to say that we talk about the spiritual aspects of Ramadan and fasting and how to curtail and minimize, you know, the loss of time in food prep, but still, of course, making sure that there's, you know, everybody who's fasting is eating well, inshallah, and so on. But really, honestly, um, you know, the communal feasts, one time there was a news reporter that was trying to report in Ramadan and she was trying to say it's the month of fasting, but somehow she got it all mixed up and she said on the news report, and Ramadan is the Muslim month of feasting. And it was like, no, no, no. <laughs> and then you know what? I was like, actually, for some people, that's all it ends up being. SubhanAllah, that's not the point of the month. And for other people, their worries about Ramadan are about tarawih and communal prayer because that's such a kind of a trademark or hallmark of Ramadan. But I hear too, like speaking of Sira, since you know we've been doing Sira, I've shared with you a little bit about this topic as well and how when the Ramadan, uh, sorry, tarawih was, um, uh, the command of tarawih came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it actually um, came down and in his own lifetime, this is where people get very, um, uh, very, uh, uh, most people don't even know the story. It's it's kind of like, unfortunately, lost in our history. But when the, the Ramadan was, when Tarawih was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu in Ramadan, on the first night that it came, the Prophet Sallallahu prayed it in his masjid after Aisha. And some of the companions noticed that he prayed something extra. So they thought, oh, there's a new prayer that's been commanded by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, And so he was praying and they joined him. The next night, more people joined him. And they told other people, hey, the Prophet has a prayer that he's praying after Aisha, how exciting, let's pray. And by the third night, more eBay people came out to um, uh, you know, join the prayer, but the Prophet prayed in his home. And later he came out and he said to them, it's not unknown to me, it was not unknown to me that you all were here waiting for me. However, I chose to pray in my home because I feared that you would take this tarawih to be a fard instead of a sunnah. And um, therefore, and until the, the, the Prophet's death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prayed tarawih in his home, and so did all of the companions. And it continued this way through the Khilafa of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And it continued this way until a portion of the Caliphate of Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu anhu, until Sayyidina Umar felt like the masajid had become empty and people weren't taking tarawih seriously and they weren't doing the sunnah of tarawih altogether. And then he commanded that tarawih be brought back into the masjid as a communal prayer. And it is he who instituted the 20 rak'ahs. So some people even call it a sunnah umariya because, he, <laughs> because tarawih can be as minimum as two or as max as however many. And people say, well, what was the sunnah of the Prophet? Uh, you know, because really tarawih, what it is, is part of a qiyam layl. It's happening in Ramadan. And so 20 became the, you know, the consistent number that was prayed for many, many generations. And it fluctuated all throughout Islamic history. That number would change slightly, right? But and nevertheless, the idea here is, the idea here is for Ramadan, for, for tarawih, that it was first and foremost a sunnah that was prayed at home. And yes, there was a strong uh, uh, sunnah of what? Praying it communally. However, just because we're prevented from praying it congregationally or community in jama'ah, it should not prevent us from praying it. So when you pray at home by yourself or with your small group family praying it, then you say, Alhamdulillah, I'm adopting the sunnah of the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who prayed Sallallahu at home. So all of that anxiety, see, if we knew our seerah, if we knew our history, if we knew the, 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 the back story of things, we wouldn't necessarily feel as anxious and have this difficulty, right, with, with some of these worries that were coming through um, with the back worries. But granted, nevertheless, it is something we are considering and thinking about. But I wanted to share with you that back story, that histor the part of our history that we've lost and don't know anymore. Um, also, um, here, you know, 
for, for those of you who attended the Holocaust before, you know that one of my very favorite topics, very, very favorite topics, <laughs> um, in which there are recordings on this at the Rahma Foundation as well, is the concept of i'tikaf, or spiritual seclusion for a woman. And this too is something people are anxious about, saying, oh, we always do i'tikaf in the month of Ramadan. And for the men, they will be more impacted by this because men can only do i'tikaf in the masjid. But women can do atikaf in their homes, right? And they are not limited by Ramadan because the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, was he would do atikaf yearly, which was Ramadan. He would do atikaf monthly, right? In certain times of the month. He would do atikaf weekly, particularly on the night of Thursday into Friday. He would do atikaf daily in certain times, like between Maghrib and Isha. Right, the kind of time we're in right now, or um, uh, uh, you know, at the Fajr time, and so his Sunnah was to be constantly in a state of throughout the the year. He was doing atikaf, and he was not limited to just Ramadan. And so many people try to pigeonhole atikaf to just Ramadan. Now, I had just said earlier, what did Allah give us with this pandemic that we're dealing with? He gave us time, and when you have time. What do you need for atikaf? The most important ingredient is what? Time. And often people do not have the time to sit and reflect and go into a spiritual seclusion. Now I encourage you, inshallah, we don't have time to go through all the rules and maybe we'll do a different recording or you can access the ones on the Rahma Foundation previously on the woman's atikaf. Because it's very, very simple. Very, very simple. Because it's only a matter of saying your intention and blocking off a space in your room or your home for your spiritual seclusion, your atikath. And if there's ever a time for spiritual seclusion and really contemplating on why Allah has sent this pandemic to humanity, it is now, right, to do atikath. And I think about how, you know, um, this hadith where the Prophet wasallam said, um, ni'ma summa, uh, sum, uh, Right? How wonderful is the monastery of a believer is his home. Right? And this concept of doing atikaf, or there's another word we use of khalwa, you know, being in seclusion, is a beautiful thing. And for the woman's atikaf, it doesn't have to be days on end. It could actually be even just minutes, hours, portions of a day short bits of time is sufficient enough for atikaf, right? And you intend to go on atikaf and you spend some time in that spiritual seclusion on your prayer rug or the space of atikaf that you designated in your home. And you do prayer, you do dhikr, you read Quran, you do tafakkur, tafakkur, tadabbur. What those translate into is contemplation, doing dhikr, a remembrance of Allah, right? Doing, thinking about the blessing Allah has given us. Like as much as we were anxious about all of what's happening and, and worried about it, the reality is we actually still have electricity and running water as of now, alhamdulillah, right? Unlike my parents who I called earlier and had none of that. And for example, we still have a sense of safety, even though we can't enter into our masajid at the moment or have jum'ahs rather into it enters them still, alhamdulillah, but we can't have jum'ah in them, but we can have these small congregations in our homes still. Right? We're not prevented like those who are in dictatorships in which they will not allow you to go into a Muslim space, or if you do, you get hit into a prison underground. Right? There isn't that persecution. Right? Think about those blessings. Do you think about the blessings of those of you who are still those of us who are still healthy? Alhamdulillah. Even if we're carrying the virus but not immunocompromised, alhamdulillah. Right? And for those of us who may get sick but recover, alhamdulillah. Right? And for those of us who may get sick and for it is an expiation of our sin, may Allah help us recover, alhamdulillah. Right? And for those of us who have our children in health and blessings around us, alhamdulillah. And that our elders are still well, and alhamdulillah. Right? There's so much to be thankful for. Right? My teacher would say that one of the best ways to do uh, acts of ibadah, to do in atikab, is to start from your head and go to your feet. And to thank Allah everything from Ya Allah, these eyes that you've given me, right? If I, this, this quarter I had a student who is visually disabled, had a visual disability in my class um, and she always had her dog with her and um, 
and it was the first time I had a student in my class who had a visual disability. And it was so interesting to me to teach a student who um, I would have, you know, either I was writing something on the whiteboard or had a, you know, the PowerPoint running the slides. And um, every so often I would point to something and then I remember she couldn't see it. Or I would want to play, um, you know, play something, play a, like a TED talk or something. And alhamdulillah, she could hear it, but she couldn't see it. And I would make references to, and did you see on, and I'd remember, oh, I have a student who, so it like really made me like reframe the way I was teaching by one student in the class. And I think about what if that was me? How would my life drastically change, right? These are the kind of blessings. We don't know the blessings we have and the meaning of them until they're gone, right? This is the point of spiritual seclusion. That's the point of atikaf. That is the point of doing this tadabbur and tafakkur concept because you don't, it's to thank Allah for what you have before it's gone. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember me in times of ease, I will remember you in times of hardship. Right, but as, most, as as people, as human beings, our very nature is that we take things for granted. We don't think about them until they're gone. Right, so that this ibadah that Allah has given us, a sunnah that we we learn from the Prophet sallallahu and it is said it is one of his strongest sunnahs that it said about him that if there was ever a sunnah that was so close to fard, because he never left it. Most sunnahs we know they're sunnahs because sometimes he would do them, and sometimes he'd leave them to teach us they were a sunnah, not a However, Atikaf was the one sunnah, one of the sunnah, he never, ever, ever left. So the scholars would say, if there was ever a sunnah that we would have all thought it would have been a fadid, it would have been Atikaf, right? My teachers describe it as, you know, the pressure cooker, those of you who ever used a pressure cooker, you know that a pressure cooker has a valve, a steam valve. And it allows the, the steam to go out. And if you forget to turn that on, or if you, especially the old ones, you know, right? It builds, 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 pressure, anxiety, pressure, anxiety, difficulty, pressure, stress, stress, right? Builds, builds, builds. And if there is no valve to let the steam out, what happens? The whole thing explodes. And that is exactly like us. And so my teacher would often say, Atikaf is your valve, your steam valve that otherwise you're going to explode or implode, right, without it. You must have atikaf in your life. And woman, alhamdulillah, we can have atikaf in our very homes. And now we have even more time than before. Yes, you may have kids at home, and yes, you may have your spouse at home working, and yes, you may have, and you're trying to juggle all of this strangeness that hasn't been there before. But nevertheless, by and large, there's just more time. Right. And so with that, I just want to really, you know, kind of emphasize um, the use that we can get. Being again that we're mothers, there's one more major thing that I wanted to make sure that we talked about today. And that is um, kids. There are a lot of people who are um, who are really concerned about, uh, you know, um, uh, anxious about being quarantined <laughs> with their kids or their kids just being home from school um, for extended periods of time. Um, and uh, they're just worried and thinking, you know, wondering about their sanity, levels of sanity, you know, mashallah. Because after at first it's like, yeah, we're on vacation. But the problem is you can't really go anywhere and you can't really have sleepovers and uh, play dates, right? Which otherwise could have distracted the kids there, you know, because again, as Muslims, we're following the precautions that are put in place. And you can't have the friends over and the cousins over and the whatever, you know, mashallah. So like, and then your alternatives are like tech, which we really want to discourage using it intensely. Um, you know, this is the time to really connect on a person-to-person -person level for some extent. So this is where the board games come out and the puzzles come out and the the all the all the crafty things if if your kids are interested in crafting, right? The knitting and the sewing and the and the, you know, the what do you call that? The um you know, and the, the, the whole big bucket of Legos it, it comes out and <laughs> building together, right? And, to, and, and really using your creativity. And it does require more of you. But, you know, we're often told by experts in the field that children, even though they may say, no, no, I'd rather watch a movie. No, no, I want to play this video game. No, no, I want to do this, whatever. Um, that there is actually no substitute to 
the direct interaction of parent and child. And again, this is a different topic for a different day. We talk about the Rahma Foundation. We also have the Raising a Spiritual Child series. And this concept of like getting to their level and being with them and listening to them and listening to their fears too. Because by the way, they're scared also. Last year in Christ Church, when this happened, we did a whole webinar and a whole article that's on Muslim matters that you could read about how do you talk to your children about difficult and fearful and anxiety-driven things, right? And this is a really important concept, but one of them is listening to them because they're they're picking up a lot of what you're role modeling and they're picking up on. So if you're really getting really anxious about this, they are too. And if you're kind of like, okay, this is a strange circumstance that we're in, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, right? You know, hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. You know, you're going to find that, that by and large, they're going to also sort of be like, <laughs> you know, I had a friend, and I have to say this, and I'll give her credit for this later, but she posted on one of our threads that their family did a family juma today at home, and um, <laughs> and uh, and they they tried to they tried to mimic what would happen in juma. So you know, like after the Friday prayers, usually somebody gets up and does announcements. Right for the <laughs> and so as as a kind of jokingly, you know, they said, you know, who wants to do announcements for Juma? Uh, kind of like what would have happened in the masjid? And she said her son got up and she said without even missing a beat, he said, little son, he <laughs> got up and he said, there's a black sedan that's parked illegally in front of the parking lot. You know. <laughs> <laughs> all of them just dissolved into laughter because that's usually the announcements that would happen at Shema, inshallah. And, um, and there are little moments like that that are just precious and they're worth it and they require more time from you, whether that time is in crafting or in creativity or coming up with imaginary scenarios and worlds if for little kids for them to play in, or if they're older kids, you know, really trying to get into some deeper discussions and not just 100% tech. But I'm with you. This is going to be hard. I don't know exactly what to do, being vulnerable with you too, mashallah. But I think like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, you know, if you ask me, I will give you. And if you thank me, I will increase you. Right? That if you um, thank me, I will increase you, mashallah. So if we thank him for the many things that we do have still, right? He will give us openings and give us more, inshallah ta'ala. And so with that, you know, um, I'm going to share with you a couple of the things that I, a couple of the ayat of Quran that I, and, and a hadith, and I'm going to end with these, that I have really um, benefited from, that I hold on to in times like this. Um, and just a reminder for me, myself first, and all of you, inshallah, that in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Reminds us, you know, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها that Allah does not burden a soul more than it can bear. And so, if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent us this difficulty and this tribulation, this trial that He has sent to us, then clear, clearly there is something from it that He wishes from us to take away from it. Um, and maybe many of us will not get ill. Alhamdulillah. But what is the wisdom in all of this? You know, that is the thing. And maybe some of us will get ill. And may Allah protect us and. Um, and, and bring us to shifa, tam, you know, full and complete remission of the illness, inshallah ta'ala. But I think about this as a believer, as a, as a faithful person, a person of faith. And when you think about things, when they become really overwhelming like this, you have to always remember that Allah has told us that when times are tough, he's made us tougher. And that whatever he brings our way, he will make it go away. And that if he brought us, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us to it, he will bring us through it, inshallah ta'ala. And I think that's really, really core. I mean, those are words I hold on to because that ayah in the Quran is clear and Allah has made that oath, right? That he will not burden a soul more than it can bear. And he reminds us, you know, um, you know, right? That he will not actually, nothing will happen to us except what is written or ordained for us. And so it's true, like I said earlier, the part that the truth of what Allah has written for you is going to come to you. But we also tie our camels, mashallah. And the hadith that I really, the hadith Qudsi of the Prophet وسلم, that I think is really, really powerful. And I'm going to read it to you because I think this is key to our discussion. Where he says, Sallallahu Alaihi he says, be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find him in front of you. 
If you ask, then ask of Allah. And if you seek help, then seek help from Allah. And know if all the nations were to gather together to benefit you, to bring you good, they can only benefit you with what Allah has already prescribed for you. And if all the people and nations were to gather to harm you, they can only harm you with what Allah has already written for you. The pens have been lifted and the ink has dried. And that is powerful, powerful, powerful. You know, that if you're going to ask for help, ask of Allah. And if you're going to seek out that help, seek it from Allah. And know that nothing can harm you except that it's already written for you. And nothing can help you except that it's already written for you. And this is the place of a person of faith. They are mindful of Allah. They are God conscious and God centered, right? And the other uh, hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, be mindful of Allah and you'll find him in front of you and recognize and acknowledge Allah in times of ease and prosperity. He will remember you in times of adversity, like we said earlier. So alhamdulillah, these are kind of things that with victory comes patience, relief, with affliction, hardship, with ease. These are all parts of the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ told us about. And I hope that inshallah some of these words remind us um, uh, of where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stands with us in these moments, that he sent us lessons to learn, but he sent us also, you know, inna ma'al usri yusra, with every difficulty comes ease. And sometimes people mistranslate this and say, you know, after every difficulty comes ease, and it's not, it's ma'a, it's with, it's with every difficulty comes ease. And with this pandemic this is a tribulation and difficulty but with it will come ease and each person will see that in its own way subhanallah how that ease comes so i pray for you and me that inshallah Allah shows us that ease um and this tribulation that we're all kind of collectively entering into that we come out of it with tathir and part of that is tathir that purification is asking Allah for repentance uh, for, for forgiveness and wouldn't it be neat if each and every one of us went back into our you know uh, our khalwas into our atikafs and did our just not our remembrance but also did our forgiveness our asking Allah for forgiveness and in that we each did a full tawbah ya allah you sent this difficult thing to us you know and what is your wisdom in it is it for us to ask forgiveness for you have we transgressed against humanity have we transgressed against the animal kingdom have we transgressed against each other have we transgressed against the environment what is it ya rabbi what is the wisdom in which that you're teaching us the plagues that have come before us and the illnesses that have come before and the mass diseases that have come before this one is affecting so many people at once across the globe right? And because we're all so connected, you hear news so quicker, much quicker than you ever had in history before, right? So it's scarier. So when you think about this pandemic that's happening, Ya Allah, what is the wisdom you're bringing with us? And and with that, you know, I'm really reflecting on how um, uh, the repentance, asking Allah for forgiveness, because should it be transgression that's bringing this ibtila, this tribulation, then wouldn't it be neat that if each and every woman and each and every man, each and every person did a personal tawbah, that there would also be like this communal tawbah. Like here, those of us who are in California, this like San Francisco Bay Area tawbah, and this LA tawbah, and this California tawbah, and this, you know, eventually different states, this American tawbah, and then this like <laughs> worldwide tawbah, and this like tawbah across the world to make this go away. Maybe it's time for a collective tawbah and repentance globally. Um, and so I hope, inshallah, that we're going to um, take that very, very seriously in thinking about why Allah has sent this to us, but also knowing that with it will come ease as well, and inshallah, connectedness. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I hope this was um, a useful discussion for all of you. <clears throat> I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that uh, I know some of you have had some questions here on the panel on the side, and I believe we do have a couple of um, minutes for some questions that I will read, you know, from the chat box that you've written here. But I do encourage you as well to um, join us, inshallah, in our future. Make sure that you're signed up with us at the Rahma Foundation so that you know when we're having our halakas and uh, classes and join our live streams and join our, um, 
you know, uh, monthly sessions that go out <coughs> with uh, First Sisters uh, throughout, uh, not just locally, but throughout the country, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Um, there's definitely, and, and I do have to put in this one last thing. Um, you know, I've heard some of the imams talking today and in the last, you know, on, on our kind of scholars um, lists and threads, people are saying, oh, one of, <laughs> it's interesting, different people are worried about different things. And so some of the leadership is worried about how in Ramadan we won't have our collective uh, get togethers and so therefore no fundraising. <laughs> and so subhanAllah, that's what one, one of the things they're worried about, which makes sense because funds are what allow institutions to run and programs to run. And Ramadan is a time of the year when that really funnels in. And so, um, so the imams were saying, you know, we'll still do online fundraisers. So with that, inshallah, I would also say the Rahma Foundation is a nonprofit that also runs on, on your donations. And please do, um, you know, donate to that effort, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can continue these types of programming. Ya Rabbil Alameen. So inshallah, the, um, and you're seeing all kinds of wonderful slides. There is our link to donations, inshallah ta'ala. Um, a couple of you have asked some questions. I'll answer them very briefly before we close off for tonight. Um, some have asked questions related to the Atikaf, and inshallah, hopefully we'll actually do a, an entire lecture on this. We have some recordings, but maybe we'll do a fresh one to really go through the rules of Atikaf for a woman. And um, some have asked, can a woman do Atikaf while she is menstruating on her height? And the answer is, um, the Atikaf requires purity. It requires you to be in a state of Tahara. And so even though you can't formally be in a state of Atikaf when you're on your period, there are so many other types of Ibadah that you can do while you're on your period. And that is an important lesson and discussion that we should also have as women. Um, I'm, I'm, this last several weeks, I've been doing this course with girls, Women's Fiqh Untangled, and we have outlined how the vast majority of the things that you can do on your period, and it's only the minority of things that you can't do while on your period. So inshallah, we'll try to have that, um, we'll have that, you know, kind of talk coming up for the Rahma Foundation classes if you're interested in, in learning more about that. Also, um, some people have asked what about creative ideas and suggestions about supporting people who are vulnerable and needy in the community. Uh, really, this is where your creativity and, and, and brain power is going to have to come in. Um, I was really thinking earlier, you know, looking at the things that have been stockpiled, right? Um, and, and thinking about, well, do we need every single one of these bags of rice, every single one of these bags of beans, or maybe things that are those who are, for example, homeless, maybe that's not going to be very useful necessarily to give them, but things like the toothpaste and the deodorants and the warm blanket and the so on, <clears throat> especially at times where they are probably even more susceptible to COVID-19 than anyone else, where we can isolate in our homes, they don't have a home to go isolate in, right? So even more susceptible and vulnerable. So how do you help and in what capacities? Um, and so this is where it's going to take creativity. But if anything, especially if you have children, kind of like hunkering down with them and have them think about what are the best ways and maybe each pulling something, you know, of the extras that are around in the house and pulling together these kits, right, to give people. I've been seeing different things online where people are pulling together um, little Ziploc bags and putting the hand sanitizer and the wipes and the, you know, and the... Um, <clears throat> A bar of soap and so on in these little care packages and giving them to those who are unable to get out like the elderly or like the um, the homeless and so on. So I would encourage you to, to think about um, those creative ideas as well, inshallah ta'ana. I think there's been a um, the last question, inshallah, that I'll take. Um, some people have been asking um, uh, the how do you, um, I mentioned something related to Jumu'ah prayers, and I want to clarify that. And uh, I want to be, be very, very clear that when I mentioned the Hanafi ruling on praying, um, th you know, with the imam plus three, and the imam, of course, can be like your husband or your son who has reached the age of puberty, um, plus three more people, and then everyone else who'd like to join, like if there are other women in the family or kids in the family that can join that. I want to be very clear that the rule on the Hanafi school of the musallah, which doesn't have to be inside of a masjid, but it can be a musallah or a place of prayer, um, that's non-masjid. So think about people who are like the kids who are in high school who pray, and maybe there's just a small group of them. They may borrow the or take the Hanafi opinion and pray in like the a classroom, for example, and they call it a Juma, and that's taken um, and accepted because the quorum is only three plus one. Um, but I also want to say that the rule for that is uh, of that musallah space is that it's accessible. 
So when I say home, what I mean by that is that it has to be something people can access. So that's why I mentioned not just the members of the family, but maybe also your Muslim neighbor or friend who are not ill. Okay. <laughs> and also people, and also for a very short period of time, Juma does not have to, the khutbah doesn't have to be very long. In fact, the minimum can just be wicked. And I'm sure there are other resources out there that you can access if you really would not like to know how to do this. And as I mentioned, if you can't do this, like there are alternatives. Of course, the alternative is praying the four dakas of Bukhar and doing other things on the Friday, on the day of Juma, of Friday, to still keep up with the Friday concept, like listening. If you otherwise would have listened to a khutbah, then if you're not in the masjid, listen to it online, for example. It's not going to be a khutbah, but it'll be, you know, an online lecture in the space of time that you would have listened to it. Or doing a dhikr, for example, together with your family, keeping up with the reading of, you know, so to say, kaf, for example. Things like that shouldn't be disrupted, even though the juma itself is canceled. So I hope that kind of clarifies that a little bit sad inshallah ta'ala all right with that inshallah uh, barakallahu fikum inshallah i hope this was useful we hope inshallah that we will um see you all very soon again make sure that you're part of our rahma foundation mailing list you can go to our website and and uh and join it there on our facebook page or on our uh twitter account online and again we ask you inshallah to keep us in your duas keep each other in your duas and with that we'll do our closing dua الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين يا رب يا كريم أو oh الله أو oh رب العالمين أو oh merciful shower your mercy down upon us O oh Lord of the worlds O oh Lord of the small and the unseen that has brought us to our knees we ask يا رب العالمين to lift from us this بلاء and this difficulty Ya Rabbi, lift it from our family members and from our friends and from our relatives and from our neighbors and from the people in our neighborhoods and the people across the nation and the people across the country and globally and the people of the Ummah and the people of humanity. Ya Rabbi Alameen, we ask you to be people who are God-centered, people who are God-conscious, people who are connected to you, people, Ya Rabbi Alameen, who do not lose faith or shaken by difficulties like this. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you to keep us steadfast on the straight track until the last day. Ya Rabbi, don't let us fall or falter off of the straight track ever. Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, if we know loved ones or family members that have strayed from it, we ask you to bring them back, Ya Kareem. Rudduhum ila deenaka muraddatan muraddatan jameela, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Bring them back in a beautiful and gentle manner. Ya Rabbi, let us be a reason why people come to this deen and never Flee away from it, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, let us be like lighthouses in the darkness who cast their beams into the darkness and attract people to the light, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, let us be people who benefit from what we have taught us and implemented in their lives. Ya Rabbi, never let us be people who, Ya Rabbi, people who, um, uh, who learn but do not do upon what they learn. Rabbi, do not let us be from the hypocrites, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, we ask you, Ya Kareem, to guide us and to help us, and to uplift us, and to, to bring us closer to you. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to fill our hearts with love of you, and love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask to be beloved to you. We ask, Ya Rabbi al-Alameen, that our children be beloved to you, and have the love of you and the love of the Prophet fill their heart, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to guide us and to guide our children, and Ya Rabbi, to help us raise them in the best manner possible. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to be people who are on the straight track and our progeny ila yawm al-deen until the end of time, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi al-Alameen, we ask you in this time of tribulation, Ya Rabbi, that we are people who don't remember you just in times of tribulation, but also in times of ease. Ya Rabbi, remember us in times of ease and in times of hardship. Ya Rabbi, help us and help our brothers and fellow sisters and brothers in humanity. Ya Rabbi, let us be people who help others and not are and are not self-centered and selfish, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi Alameen, we ask you to honor us with Islam and to increase us in Iman and to bless us, Ya Rabbi, with Ihsan. Ya Rabbi Alameen, we ask you to be people who remember our sisters and brothers in faith and across the Ummah and sisters and brothers in humanity. Ya Rabbi, help us help them with our time, with our energy, with our knowledge, with our money, 
Ya Rabbi, let us be people who are always in your service, in the khidmah of this deen. Ya Rabbi, use us in this deen. Ya Rabbi, let us be those who are in khidmah of this deen. Ya Rabbi, Ya Kareem, we ask you to forgive us our sins, the small and the big. Ya Rabbi, this tribulation you brought to us, we do not know whether it is because of sin or whether, Ya Rabbi, it is because of a test or whether, Ya Rabbi, it is simply what you have said in the Qur'an that we, have we will taste a loss of life and loss of wealth and uh, food and fruits and people. Ya Rabbi, we ask you that this tribulation that you lift it from us. Ya Rabbi, you have guaranteed that with every illness you'll send its cure. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, send the cure. Ya Rabbi, send the cure in the hands of those who are working on it now, Ya Kareem. Lift this from us and help us. And help those who are elderly and those who are young and those who are pregnant and those who are who are, who are immunocompromised, those who are already unhealthy in different illnesses and diseases, Ya Kareem, we ask you to strengthen them and give them health, Ya Kareem. And those of us who are not ill yet, we ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to protect us and to bring and to put a barrier between us and the illness, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you to relieve our anxieties and our pain and our difficulty. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to guide us and to help us. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you to be from people of light. Ya Rabbi, people of nur. Ya Rabbi, that on the last day that we are clearly identified from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because of the nur on our faces and our limbs from our prayer and our wudu. Ya Rabbi, on that day when people run every which way, that we are clearly shaded under the shade of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then on the day that you ask us, Ya Rabbi, the questions that you will ask us, that you are happy with our answers, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, on that day that we go straight into Jannah and have nothing to do with Jahannam. Ya Rabbi, protect us from Jahannam, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, grant us and our parents and our teachers and our children and our family members the highest levels of Jannah, Ya Kareem, with the Salihin and the Shuhada and the Anbiya and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Guide us and forgive us and honor us, Ya Rabbi, and uplift us and protect us and make us, Ya Rabbi, from those who are beloved to you. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een. Wa ala niyat al-qubool wal-hidaya wal-nasr wal-salami fi kulli makan. Read with me, sisters, for acceptance of this dua, Surah Al-Fatiha. Ameen. Barakallahu fikun. We ask you, inshallah, that you keep us in your duas, and we'll see you in very close times. Barakallahu fikun. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.